So, hi everyone and welcome to Quantum Healing with Candace. Let's see, we're a few minutes early, so I'm just going to say hi to you new people or you early people. Hi, Angela. Hi, Julie. Julie, you always seem to be here when I broadcast live. I sure appreciate that. I'm here today. I'm very excited. I'm a little nervous. I'm talking to Patricia Corey, and I followed her for a little while now uh, pretty well. And um, it's been exciting to see that she has been making the circuit and talking with some of the, the big players about her new book lately, but she's been doing this for many years. She's a celebrated author. She's a world-renowned um, spiritualist and metaphysician. She's a healer. She gives workshops. Basically, people out there, she is one of our tribe, and I sort of feel like I know her, even though today's the first time I've talked to her in real life. I want to welcome Patricia Corey. Hi, Patricia. Hi, you. Thank you for having me, and why are you nervous? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, a lot of different things. Let, let me tell you, this morning, you know, I do this regression work. I've been doing past life regression and hypnosis and uh, the quantum healing work now for about a decade. And when the ETs are involved, the electronics go haywire. And I'm even in a different room right now. I'm in a different, I, I'm, I'm 20 miles from where I started all of this and it all kind of followed me, right? All of this. I have to say something though. This is really interesting. You know how this started with us? Um, it, it was a couple few days ago, but I looked at my computer and there was an email on my computer that was from 2015. It was a group email from an acquaintance that you and I uh, have in common. It, and it was this big group email. And your name was in the sender list. I mean, in the uh, reception list. And I had no reason. I, I kept looking at this email going, why did this email show up? just on my computer. I mean, it was just sitting right there on my computer. And I'm, so I looked at it very closely. And I think that was because of you. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> I, I know. I, I know that in your book, you talked about how the very first channeling you were doing, the computer keys and, and you and you didn't even know what was going on. Um, and then the computer, you had a lot of J's or whatever, you know, all of it going like that. And you scroll back and you found that the, I find that the uh, electronics have a, a great uh, sensitivity to our connection with spirit realm. Absolutely. Of course. And, and we are, we shouldn't be surprised considering we're communicating through, I mean, I have an aversion to technology and yet I respect it for what it provides us. And it, provides us an incredible in, uh, vehicle for communication. And of course, it's my tool for receiving the Syrian High Council information. So all due respect to technology, but yeah, it's pretty hard <laughs> when you're dealing with multidimensional beings and waves and, and neurons and all of these things, not to have uh, a few uh, aberrations, shall we say. Yeah, that it goes on all the time. So I have two computers here to help me sort of watch, you know, the Facebook people and then, um, you know, the Zoom webinar itself and whoever else may be coming on and joining us in that way. And I have, um, I had them both charged up last night and this morning they're both, they were both completely depleted. <laughs> right. So, so you're going to be seeing me move my power cord while we're doing this. Um, well, welcome, and, and you are here to talk about your new book, but, but before we get to your, your new book, and I want everyone to see it because it's gorgeous and it's beautiful, and thank you so much for sending it. I did start it. I did not finish. I didn't have it long enough, and it's not fluff. It's not <laughs> fluff. I mean, I think I heard you say something the other day that you're rereading it yourself and reminding yourself of what's in it. Well, the thing is that with each book that I've done, which by the way, are now 14. Um, there's always a sense of detachment when I'm finished, like I was present, but I know that I'm very integral to the process. But on the other hand, um, it's channeled. So not all of the books that I've done are channeled, but the ones that are, when I'm done, I, I step aside. And in, fortunate enough to have a, a publisher who 
uh, kind of pre-approves what I do. It goes off to the publisher. And then uh, I wait about a month to look at it again. And I read it thinking, wow, if ever there were a case for channeling, it's surely in the fact that I can't identify, I truly can't identify to being the one who wrote it or involved in it. So this has happened much more with this latest book. I mean, poof. When I reread it, I, yeah, I, first of all, I'm having this sensation that some people, I'm sure we'll talk about this, uh, many, many people are telling me they're having quite a lot of phenomenon when they're holding the book and when they're reading the book. And I too am experiencing this. So it's pretty exciting. And uh, I love being part of the, the buzz of everyone that's being involved with the work and connecting with it on this very intense level. I want to talk more about what it's like for people to hold on to the book, but I've got a, I've got a bigger main question for you. You know, I've, I've caught parts of your recent interviews and we just, I don't want, I, last thing I want to do is go over some of the ground that you've gone over several times Great. recently because that's no fun for you. Most of, of my audience knows who you are and I want to talk about the stuff you want to talk about, but yeah. I've got a couple questions first and, and the big one is why you? Why you at the Syrian High Council? How that, how that, you know, why? why you? Okay, well, you, you know me well enough to know that I, I really emphasize how important it is to stay in humility and be grounded and understand you're just serving. And it's not unlike, which I know you understand all too well, uh, working as a healer, appreciating the fact that you're not the healer, you're just a, tra a, a transitional tool between the client and spirit or the higher self or whatever. So that said, why me? I, I guess I'm just blessed <laughs> because not only in the fact that the work has reached so many people and, and has helped so many people, but also for my own personal journey. I mean, this is quite remarkable for me to, to feel this constant love, to be surrounded in this light and to have my mission clearly defined for me since a very young age. So uh, I'm not sure why me, other than we see now at this moment of transition on the planet, all kinds of interdimensional information coming through. Some of it is not of the highest intention, and I always warn people to be very, very meticulous with their spiritual, uh, oops, I hear a strange sound. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I call it spiritual hygienics so that you make sure that you're bringing in very, very high frequencies because those astral levels are also very active and a lot of portals are being up, opened on the lower astral. And that many people are starting to receive information from different sources. So the question is, how do we maintain an extraordinarily high vibrational zone where we're pulling in this information from? and uh, and the people who are doing that, let us all be in service, in humility and grace. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Well, I really like your um, no-nonsense, uh, sometimes politically un incorrect uh, statements. That would uh, be me. I love that about you. <laughs> and I, I think many of my friends and colleagues love that about you, too. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I talk to ETs. I talk to people who've passed. I talk to people about all of their, you know, unbelievable experiences. But I also, um, you know, the whole 100%, um, you know, pooping rainbow unicorn people I, and, and, and some of that all the time is just not, um, it's not me. It's not, I don't think it's human. And I, and I'm, kind of tired of that actually um, so for me I love reading I love reading your your social media posts and some of the things that that you kind of get off on and stuff so I love how pragmatic you are uh, that you and I you and I align uh, about well that's good to hear because I don't know if everyone loves it but my well, point, that, to each his own if my point here is first of all my message always has been come on guys let's get on board with being able to look at the lower vibrational information. Let's, I don't uh, adhere to the 
uh, is it law of attraction idea that you can only think about positive, beautiful things and you will create positive, beautiful things. I think that's too insular. I think we have a responsibility to reach out and serve also those things that are not so beautiful and unicorny and, and fluffy and, and to serve them from the point of view of to bring light into those corners. And that is what I understand light working to be. Not just speaking to light workers, not just preaching to the choir, but how do we go into the dark side and, and bring light in and bring rainbows in and bring love in and start to raise the, the, the frequency of all. That's our mission. And so, yes, I, uh, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm definitely not politically correct. I'm out of America for a long time now, so it seems to be quite intense in the States. And excuse me, Canadians, I know that you take offense if, if America, if the States are referred to as America. So I'm talking about Can Canadians and the States. There's this uh, almost ludicrous to me, uh, political correctness, social correctness. I mean, it's gotten to the point where you can't say much of anything anymore without offending someone. We really need to get our sense of humor back, first of all. And secondly, yeah, I'm going to say what I think I, what I want to say. And if it offends anyone, they can unplug or unfriend or unlisten. Agreed. And wouldn't it just, you know, what I don't like is the homogenation of it. So, you know, why do we need to be clones? Why do we need to... Just be, you know, I can be friends with somebody that I don't agree with all the time. What's the problem with that anyway, right? You well, know, having the same views with, as everybody else. Well, there's, you know, it's a funny thing, but the global agenda to keep people in division on, in a certain way achieves that by keeping everybody homogenized into one, you know, very low vibration concept of what's politically correct yeah. and what's socially correct and what you can say, what you can't say. So, and, and you know, I, I mean, I got flack because I, I, I told everybody Merry Christmas and I just think that's so ridiculous. It's like, I celebrate Christmas. I'm saying Merry Christmas. If it, if it offends you, hang up. But why does it offend you? Have you been taught that this should offend you? Why possibly could anything so beautiful uh, offend? And of course, it's because we're analyzing religion and we, we hate everybody else's religion. And, you know, oh God, let's just relax a little bit and have some humor and have an opinion. And more than an opinion, have a message. Opinion has a sense of, of being quite close. Have a message, have an idea. Here's an idea. I have an idea. Let's discuss it. And uh, if we can't do that anymore, gee, I wonder if there's an agenda trying to keep us from doing that anymore. That's, that's why I love that you are uh, freeing yourself to be able to make these statements and go, you know, go on these little rants and stuff about some of the things that you do. And I, I just love it because they're always thought out and, and even handed and backed up by, you know, common sense. Let's go back to your, your book, please. This, um, so I want to talk about the, the way that it, it, it feels with people, right? When they, when they read it and when some of the things are going on in some of the multidimensional moments we talked about. I want to, I want to say that in, in the story, I did get to the part about when you were, um, the Italian family story, right? That whole story in your book, and in, when I was reading that story, before I even got to like the first part of there was a baby and there was all of this, I already knew the end of the story. I already knew the whole story before I even got to the end of the story. And I found that was amazing because that's what the story was about. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So this, this thing, and so that was a multidimensional moment, and you might want to just sort of recap what I've just said there for people who don't know what the heck I'm talking about, uh, but also go and, and tell us about some other multidimensional moments of, uh, that readers are having. Okay, I, I think I'll talk about the other dimensional moments first, and then move toward that story because it's uh, a little bit more intricate. So since this book has come out, people... A lot of people. First of all, there's wonderful excitement about the book, which thrills me. And people are having 
quite phenomenal experiences about it. At first, I was getting emails. There wasn't any discussion of it on social on about the uh, let's say the phenomena that was happening. So it wasn't like people were feeding off each other's own story. I was getting emails, Patricia. This is so weird. As soon as I put my, the book in my hands, I started feeling energy moving up my arms. And I found that when I'm holding the book like this, I, it's some kind of a circuit. I'm, I'm hypersensitive. What's going on? So there's that. There are people losing time. There are uh, people seeing light beams popping off the pages. There's all kinds of neat stuff. And this happened in other Syrian revelation material earlier on, but not to this degree. So for example, people told me that Atlantis Rising is a book that many people reported having appearing out of nowhere, falling off the bookshelf in the store, uh, kind of that kind of experience. But with, with the new book, it's just many, many people are having some level of physical uh, or heightened awareness from the book itself. I believe it's a multidimensional book. And I believe this, first of all, because it's coming from multidimensional beings, but also because so many people are having these extraordinary experiences. Something else is going on here besides the printed word. In fact, I've been putting out on social media, what have we really got here? And I think we have a verifiable multidimensional tool. And it's activating people, it's charging people, it is, uh, it may even be working on the DNA. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't want to make boastful claims. All I, can, all I want to do is report back what people are telling me. So that's exciting. And as for the story in the book, it's a chapter that talks about how time is slipping and how the fourth dimension, where we're headed, and in fact, I'm sorry, I keep backtracking on myself, where we're headed and where we are already experiencing energy. We're already, we're already getting waves of the fourth dimension fluttering over the third. I had this experience, which out of all the psychic experiences I've had, and, and there are too many to name, this one was very particular. And here's what happened. I stayed, I had to rent a, a cottage some time ago because my, my new house here in the island was under construction. So I, I was in this cottage and there was a cottage next to it, a uh, bed and breakfast type of situation. So one evening, I, I do want to preface it also by saying that this house also had a spirit in it. So there must've been some kind of a vortex where I was. Uh, but anyway, I was actually writing, sitting there writing and, um, I heard a car pull up in the communal driveway and I heard two Italian voices. It's I'm Italian and I've also lived in Italy for 32 years. So I know Italian and I recognized that it was Venetian Italian and thought to myself, I mean, talk about thought processes. I thought to myself, Oh wow, this is excellent. Venetian because it's a beautiful dialect and it's very sing songy and fun. And I said to myself, I'm going to have to introduce myself to these people. I hear the car door open and close. I hear a baby crying. The husband clearly talking to his wife and about, you get this, I'll get that. You get the baby, I've got the bag. And obvious tension between them because, and I, I remember thinking, oh, it's not easy when you first get in because I'm on an island here. It takes, it takes considerable time to get situated here. And I heard the whole conversation. I heard them trudge up to the cottage. I heard the key go in the door and the door slammed shut. So the next morning, the owner of the cottage came by and knocked on my door and asked me for a cup of coffee. And I said, wow, I'm so thrilled you've got Italians. How long are they staying? She, she just turned white. She turned sheet white. How did you know I have Italians? I said, well, I just, I heard them come in last night. She said, Patricia, they're not coming in until tonight. I said, wrong. They have a baby. I heard the baby. She said, yes, they have a baby. I said, well, they must have spent an extra night for free because there came last night. And so she was befuddled. We walked over to the cottage together, opened the door, no people, 
No, because she came to prepare the cottage for their arrival. No sheets, no towels, no nothing. They never came. That night, of course, she was shocked. It's like, what kind of psychic thing are you going through here? Et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that night, at the exact same time, the exact same sound of the car, the exact same Venetian conversation, the baby crying, replayed absolutely exactly the same. So it freaked me out because unlike clairvoyance, unlike uh, deja vu, this was different. This was like where, what happened here? Was I catapulted into another dimension? Was I thrown off the space-time continuum? Did time mutate to, was I in a parallel universe, parallel reality? With all of these heady things that are going on in my life and so many other people, I can't put a, a, a finger on this. I, I'm not still quite sure what that was. And the inevitably, maybe it doesn't matter what it was, it's just to recognize it and bring it forward, which is what I've done uh, by including that in the book, to, to people who are also having similar experiences. It's okay. We're not going crazy. Things are rapidly shifting and we're entering the fourth dimension. Well, that was just such an amazing story to hear again. I don't, I don't think I caught the part that it was the, at the exact same time. Exact same time. You know, I, I, just even hearing you say it again, I'm getting the vibrations, the chills all over my body. And I wonder so much about it. And some of what I wonder is some, you know, we go through these things and we, we're in this world, we're in this metaphysical spiritual world, but when something that big happens with us, it still shakes us. You know, it still shakes us because of the, we're 3D, we're human, we've gone through this experience, even though we counsel others about kind of accepting these kinds of things. But when something that, you know, complex and involved and different exactly. happens to you, you start, you go into a place of, it, it's very hard not to be uh, concerned about what's going on because you, you start doing the thing, right? Is something wrong with my mind, right? And, and then you say, wait a second, I'm used to stuff happening. So calm down and everything's all right. But I wonder about like the people who we lock away in our society. Definitely. Well, I, I don't start thinking something's wrong with me because it's been all my <laughs> life all my life as a psychic, but I, I am thinking, wow, I don't know where to put this. It's like, as a clairvoyant, I see so many things and I can usually recognize that what I'm seeing is a psychic image. And I don't know how to explain why to say that it's not quite as three dimensional as looking at a human being. It, it, it's kind of diminutive. I, uh, there's an aspect of a psychic vision that is, uh, probably different than anything that resembles physicality. But when it's clairaudience, and that's my stronger gift, you hear somebody saying, uh, Patricia, <laughs> and that's where they end up locking people up because you hear this voice. You, I mean, it, you know, tell a doctor that you hear voices speaking to you. And it happens that they lock so many people up that were absolutely clairaudient and hearing maybe not the highest energy, maybe they're hearing astral entities, but they're hearing. Yeah. So, you know, it gets to the point where like, okay, clairvoyant, I can manage. Clairaudient, oh boy, I've got to be careful because there's many a time where I've gone, huh? And if I'm in company, people are like, whoa, Patricia's starting to slip again. <laughs> but this was different. This was being cognizant that something was different. This was about either clearly stepping into another Patricia Corey life, a parallel life on another time belt, or I, I can't just, I don't know. I wish I did, but I don't know. But I know what I experienced was different than a lot of things I've, I've had in the past. And I, and I, I really also believe that... <clears throat> Many more people are going to start experiencing it. Sorry, I've got the door open for air. Yeah, yeah, you've got you've got quite a bit of light show going on your face, but it's all right by me if it's all right by you and the uh, 
and, and our listeners or viewers. That's all right. <laughs> what is it? Is it? Am I partially in light? Yeah, it's about across your nose now. It just started out here, but I guess uh, you know the sun is moving as it's wont to do. You know, maybe the I'll bend over like this. Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's if you're lit, and then or you can pick shadow, but maybe pick one. Well, I think it's kind of mysterious. It is mysterious. That one right there, it makes you look like you have a veil over your eyes. You know what? This makes me think we want to, it makes me think that the sun wants to be talked about. <laughs> so how okay. about, how about that? How about we talk about what's really going on here? Our community talks a lot about ascension and changing dimensions or densities, which I think actually is a little better description very often to talk about. Um, and you brought forth information from the High Syrian Council about how important the sun is in all of this. And, and for everyone out there to start by thinking, you know, what did the sun look like when you were a kid? And what does it look like now? And some of the things that's going on with the sun and in fact, all of the space. So what would you like to say about the sun and the rest of our solar system? Boy, that's a big question. If, you, <laughs> if you've read, if people have read more than just the new book or, or so, um, obviously, many people have not yet read it. The Syrian the theme, the, the essential theme to their information is that our sun is going through ascension. And this differs from a lot of the information that our communities are talking about. When they talk about ascension, nobody's talking about the sun ascending. It's either individual ascension or the earth. So the first time anyone ever talked about the sun ascending was the Syrian High Council, as far as I know. And that was way back when, 20 years ago. And their very complicated, not complicated reading, but complex thinking, how they described, and I'll be brief here because as you said, a lot of this has come out in recent interviews. Um, of course, how can you be brief about talking about the sun going through its own <laughs> astral course? <laughs> but uh, they, explain that the sun is going through its own astral cords. Is that background noise very bad? Um, it's a, you can hear it, whatever that is. I can close the door, shall we? Um, shall well, I, I only just now heard it. So if it has been getting louder, it, um, it was just now heard. I hadn't heard it till just now. All right, well, you let me know if I need to adjust I will it. do that. I will okay, do that. so they, the Syrians say that the sun and all celestial bodies are spiritual beings. And of course, that's in every pagan and, and uh, indigenous tradition that the celestial beings are, celestial bodies are in fact deities. And the council explained it very simply, how could they not be? If you believe in the macrocosm and you being expression of the, that as a microcosm, then you know that what, what you got, the macro has. And so the sun has a astral cord Planets have astral cords, and they also move into higher consciousness. So the thematic here in, in the material of the Syrians is that the sun is going about to ascend to a higher dimension, the fourth dimension first, and that is a matter of going through its own astral cord, and the astral cord is actually the black hole. And it's very fascinating because we were terrified of black holes just a decade ago, but now with Stephen Hawking and Michio Kaku renaming the aspect or the, cat, the quality of a black hole, now they're saying, gee, maybe black holes aren't that place where all gravity crushes all matter into oblivion, but rather a passing point to another dimension or universe. And this was very, this was revolutionary when it first came out in the Syrian revelations. There were no quantum physics talking about that that I know. And so probably there were, but uh, not that I knew of. Right. So that is the thematic, that, that it's the sun, not the earth, uh, that, that act, well, so earth by proxy is going along with all the other planets going to ascend, pass through uh, this hole into another dimension, as faster than the speed of light so that we may not even recognize that's what's happening. And I tell people, if you have a trouble understanding this, just take a good look at the sun. Some people have started to notice that the sun is white. It never used to be white. 20 years ago, it was yellow. 
the sun is white now. And, and so there are people who say, well, that's because there's no more ozone or uh, whatever. But yeah, I think there's more to it. I think the sun is shedding its physical skin. And of course, that's physical terminology for what I mean, but I'm sure you understand. Raising its vibration, raising its frequency, purifying itself and now reflecting white ray instead of yellow. How exciting is that? That is one of one physical proof we have of what's really going on. It's very exciting to me because I love to, I love to be balanced in somewhere between science as I understand it, which is only <laughs> thanks to the council really, and spirit. Because as you said at the onset of this conversation, the, the woo-woo, la-la land uh, type of spirituality, all it seems to do is gen regenerate itself amongst the circles of people that are into that vibration. But it segregates us, it separates us from being able to communicate more lofty ideas. So let's find a nice balance between science and spirit. And that's one of my missions. I, I think that's the mission of a lot of people who I have the greatest respect for in our community. You know, Greg Braden and some of those, uh, really some of the, the true leaders of, of our community. And I appreciate the work that you do. Um, I also thought as I was reading that, that some of the, the most balanced information about um, humans effect on the temperature and global warming and that kind of stuff it was one of the most balanced statements about that whole thing. It, it, another thing to divide us, the global warming is real, global warming is not real, yet nobody talks about cosmic warming. And yet people who say cosmic warming, they go, man, whatever the humans do doesn't matter. But in your book, it talks about this, this very balanced approach. It's like, yes, this is happening, but you humans also are, are doing your, your part to, to muck things up. How could we not believe that we are affecting the temperature and the, the atmosphere of this planet when we are lining it with plastic? We are filling the oceans with plastic, for starters. Chemicals, hormones. Uh, we won't even begin to talk about geoengineering the skies. Yeah. We are, I mean, we, we, they, we, whoever it is, these marauders who are flying and uh, encircling, encasing the planet in chemtrails. And, you know, I, I'd like to me just mention that for a minute for who, whoever does or does not believe in chemtrails. You know, what kind of a global economy can sustain flying planes over every inch of the planet 24-7? Where's the money for this coming? This is gigantic. So... Anyway, there's that. And I personally feel that there is the sun in its evolutionary process. It appears, and, and Russian scientists have validated, that the planets are all warming up. We know Mars is warming up, and for, of course, I understand that it's also because we're terraforming it. Even Pluto is warming up. So to the people who are sitting in the ice age of North England and the United States, the East Coast, uh, the argument against global warming is, yeah, sure, here we are in minus 50 degrees and you want to talk to me about global warming. But you've got to remember that we now have absolutely militarized weather. And if people don't believe that, you need to do your homework. The, the United States military has been exploring weather control for 45 years at least. And they now have the technology to put it into effect. So without wanting to, you know, destroy your radio channel by, <laughs> by bringing up an unpleasant subject, uh, let's suggest that perhaps sporadic weather phenomena are actually orchestrated and that might not be the natural or, or let's say the global situation. I personally see this planet warming up dramatically. The oceans are rising and... Uh, regardless of sporadic moments where I believe controlled weather patterns can, can create things like northern, sorry, the east coast of the state. Yeah, the planet's warming up dramatically. Look at the poles are melting. I mean, come on, guys, let's get with the program. So 
The fact that we're still discussing that and arguing about it, I think, is also deliberate. And, and uh, like you said, they're going to keep us talking about issues that are, you know, let's move beyond the if it is or not. And what are we going to do about it? What really is the human race capable of doing about these ecological situations? Because if I truly believe that of all the things that we, we need to focus on right now, and, you know, we've got maniacs pointing nukes at each other, we've got insanity at, at every level of politics, but nothing is more urgent and nothing is more grave than the ecological imbalance on this planet. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the wanting to control the planet and all of its resources, uh, everything and that extends outward into, um, you know, our moon and the space around us. And I know that one of the things you wanted to talk about today was that that idea of manipulation of space and how we're understanding what space is. And you know what, there's actually, there's actually a quote. I think it's, um, I, I wanted to read a quote out of your book about, forgive me, I'm shuffling papers. I wanna see if I have the page. Yes, on page 126 of your book, there's, there's this most wonderful quote. And maybe that'll bring us into space for our next topic. So the high, the High Council says there's a train that is emphasizing now, whatever it is. <laughs> I'm glad for these background sounds. Yes, it, it, it happens every time when I do a session. Um, so the fact that space itself is not a void. It's a wholly conscious, interacting energy field, constantly altered by the intentions, thoughts, consciousness of every being within it. I don't know if I may vibrate through the floor before I finish. Uh, <laughs> Space is neither uniform nor stable, and all is a, in a perpetual state of evolution, interaction, and mutation. Every celestial form, every sound emits, and every thought that rides the waves of the unified field affects the quality, the density, and the formation of space. Whew. Can so, I just can I, I get these incredible I, rushes? I, I mean, even I know. I know, Patricia, I know it's a big one when my face vibrates and my face <laughs> is vibrating right now. Woo! -hoo! Yeah, it's really very beautiful that. Yeah, happens. yeah. So you want me to, to, to speak to that? Yeah. I mean, what can I possibly say that could even come close to the vibration of, of that prose? But... Um, <laughs> How we might be experiencing it. How do we first step a toe into that being 3D? Okay. NASA and the powers that be have kept us so isolated from the idea of space that we, you know, we, we're still somewhere in our, in our atmosphere trying to figure out the beyond. And whether or not what we've been shown is real or not is an argument, is a discussion for another day. But According to the council, it's not. And the, our understanding of space is completely incorrect. And the, I mean, they don't use that language. That's me summarizing because they're not in, in judgment. But uh, they're trying to express to us that actually, as you just so read to us, space is, uh, is vibrant. It, it has a consciousness of its own material. It is... Think about what's in space because we think of it as a void and we leave our atmosphere and poof we float away and and then miraculously come back via some sort of uh, man-made uh, power source so the council say actually it's very easy to traverse space all you have to do is understand how to connect with it consciously which is a huge concept even though it's, it's a, it's not that huge, we get this. And that um, so many alien species, and excuse me for using the word alien, I really don't like it, off planet species, know how to do this. They know how to connect with the fiber of space telepathically. They know how to actually readjust space around their craft by communicating with it telepathically. And and this is also present in the book, they say, actually, this is very elementary. If you consider your basic science, 
your basic science, high school science teaches you that when you warm up molecules or atoms, they expand and they become active and they move around. And when you cool them down, they contract and move less, right? This is like, you know, high school biology. So they say that the more sophisticated space travel is very simple. And, and this is how you get the 90 degree turns. This is how you get the incredible speed. This is how you get it all. This is how you get craft popping in and out of our atmosphere. It's because they, uh, they know how to adjust the atomic essence of space around their craft. How cool is that? We do not need jet propulsion. We do not need these gigantic penis, uh, <laughs> what are they called? Rockets and this whole gigantic, I call it the penis affair. Uh, <laughs> all we need to do is understand space, understand it. So how exciting to think that actually you don't need engines. And this is very interesting because we have information from Roswell and various sources tell us different things about the craft that they, they did or did not find. But in reports that we've been hearing from a lot of, uh, let's say, ET investigators, I've heard that a lot of the craft are almost completely free of any mechanisms. I'm sure you've heard this. UFO craft that have, that have been found or, or that are parked in Area 51 have no particular um, throttles and things like that. Why? Because what they're actually doing is just manipulating the space. And if we get that, then time travel, wormholes, parallel realities, all of these things traversing space into other universes, other galaxies, it changes everything. So we're quite antiquated in our idea, or at least what we're being told is the idea from NASA of what it takes to traverse space. And I'd like to also add that they know a lot more than they tell us, obviously, and they are working on those levels too, but we're still antiquated. We sure are. You know, people who do this quantum healing work, the regression work, the hypnosis that we do, you know, we meet people who are star seeds all the time or have contact with off planet beings, um, either three dimensional or, you know, more energetic type beings. And this, and their crafts are always guided by consciousness. One of the things that came out in one of my sessions that I thought was particularly fascinating was your scientists measure height, width, date, depth, and density, but they don't measure the um, time measurement, the time component. There's a, every, everything that you can measure also has an, an, another measurement that is a time measurement, and sure. that puts it in a place. So that is how this cup can go to you know, the other side of the room without um traveling the distance to get there Ooh, and as i say this i was at my parents house yesterday and a cup went from the cabinet to the window while we were in that room and i was like how did it do that maybe that's what that did <laughs> it, it it hold on it flew or you found yeah. it no we it went from a cabinet about 10 feet over to the bottom of a window while my father and i were in the other room Oh boy. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I've got my own theories about that one, but let's not, let's not go there. Hey, speaking of, of what NASA knows and what doesn't know, what do you make of the recent Pentagon um, statements? It's uh, you know, they're making statements. They're making statements about UFOs and uh, craft and stuff. These aren't leaked um, information. These are actually official statements so you know most of us who've been watching these kinds of things for a little while going yeah what's um what's your real motive here what what are you really saying what what you, we know you're trying to own the story but i wonder if you have any thoughts about that i hadn't heard you speak to that issue yet i have spoken about it i first of all anything that comes out of the pentagon or any other government source i take with an extreme grain of salt i i cannot believe there's not a modus operandi behind what they're doing and saying so about this announcement and the fact that it was flashed across the, across the New York Times, 
yeah, here's what I think. I think that we, we have been in disclosure for so many decades. And in, in, no more, in the new Syrian revelations, it starts talking by talking about how Clinton presented us with the rock, the Martian rock, and where we've come since then. So let's just talk about that for a minute. 20 years ago, when he presented that rock, we weren't ready to even hear about the possibility of bacteria in a rock from Mars. And of course, it's, it's kind of a little bit of my sarcasm in the uh, opening chapter about that, which is it took NASA 10 years to figure out that this was not, a, not, not bacteria. 10 years, the government's top scientists, NASA, universities, 10 years to figure out whether or not in a rock that supposedly came from Mars, but I don't know how they proved that, yeah. uh, this bacterial form, which doesn't take a genius to see it is a bacteria, was not. Anyway, that 10 years was massage time, massage for the human mind, the mass mind. How are they receiving this? Doesn't seem to bother anybody? Okay, let's move on to the next step. All right, so now we've now got this, you know, acceptance of the fact that, yeah, maybe it's bacteria. But pre that, uh, in my own conversations, if I were to say to somebody, I believe there's, there's at least a bacterial form of life on Mars, I would have been blown off the road. So we are in a perpetual state of disclosure. And this is something that it's very important to put across because the UFO ET community is berserk on every kind of information and there's a lot of real information and there's a lot of hype and anyone can come out and say they own the information and seed a whole line of sto a storyline that is based on not a lot uh, a lot of whistleblowers that are just about to die come out with their dying statements and disappear so I don't know, I, I, I'm very circumspect. I have a very, very powerful discernment meter. And what I wanna say is, I think we are being prepared for global contact. So I think we all, I think we, we all agree there is already an a ET presence on this planet. It, you only need to go sit outside your house a few nights in a row to see crap all over the joint. And some of them may be planes, and some of them may be human, and some of them may be holograms, but there's activity going on in the night sky. And I think that it's imminent that we're going to have contact. And yes, they want to own it. They need to own it because they believe they need to own it because they believe that we're too immature to handle it. And quite honestly, we need to raise our vibration as a global population to be able to handle it, right? We do, and actually I'm, I'm kind of thrown to a note that I wrote down here and maybe also back to previous in our conversation about talking about space and then my body vibrating and that's, you know, it's a physical manifestation of raising of our vibration. And while I was thinking about that, I was suddenly thinking about um, the transporter room in Star Trek. And I wonder like if they were, vibrating those, you know, vibrating them into another place. If that vibration thing is actually how we're going to move each other by raising our vibration so, 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 so high, you know, not just the outside of our skins and our hairs going up, but I wonder if it's going to, if, if we are going to feel it in, in a more and more physical manner as, as we go through this process. I think so. Even the fact that so many people are, feeling something emanating from this book it's like it's not just mental it's not just like you and i just had that wonderful charge uh they're feeling the information on some visceral level again i don't know how to explain other people's experiences but i do think that we we have these gifts we have clairsentience we have and and we're talking about clairsentience now being able to feel it on some other level and all of these things for all of us with a planet that is activating more and more, it makes sense that more and more we're going to feel it. And provided that we are not anesthetized 
with drugs. And, you know, I, you, you were speaking about me being on a rant. Yes. And I just, I am not in judgment of anybody that's using substances. So let's remove that. However, as a healer of 30 years, people would come to me loaded on Prozac. Back when I was doing hands-on healing, uh, numbed on Valium or Prozac and lie down on the, on the bed. And I'd say, hold it. Because my, as soon as I would go into their field, like it, it was like a rubber blanket. And I would say, what kind of med are you on? Prozac? Yeah. I said, please get up. Sorry? I go, please get up. I'm not going to fight with a Prozac shield. You're obviously preferring to numb yourself than to heal yourself. So I'm not going to go through the dance of pretending to wave some crystals around here. And so I'm very alarmed at the massive abuse of opioids, not even the street drugs, not even the recreational drugs, but the opioid use on this planet, and particularly in North America, is shocking. And people, on the one hand, say they want to raise their consciousness and they want to have a clean experience, and then the other tell me that they're using Valium to manage their pain. Now you don't get there. You don't get there. Because it's, it's about numbing your pain, therefore numbing your experience, numbing your awareness of your own body. And by the way, pain is there to tell you what's wrong. If you're going to numb it, you're going to deal with it maybe when you're down the road and it's no longer something you can heal. But uh, that's why I would tell people to get up because if you're numbing, you're not, you're not healing and I'm not going to go through the dance. So I freaked out a few people until the word was out. <laughs> Patricia could tell if you've been <laughs> taking your Prozac. Yeah. And I, I think that the reason why I bring this up is that it's for the entire population. We, and this is why I said if people are ready, because we have a serious drug problem on this planet. And thank you, Big Pharma, for making it you know, your job to anesthetize even children. And this is one way that the human extension is being sabotaged. Yeah. So people, please think about it. Every chemical you put in your mouth, everyone has an effect on your body awareness. And people will, of course, need meds. Some say they need meds. But by God, if there's anything you, one thing that I want to drive home is, please, do everything you possibly can before you resort to pain and mood medication. I think that's wonderful advice. And it's advice I know a lot of my colleagues give as well. You know, I think there's a couple of things that I would like to react to in that way. First is, do you know how many prescriptions for antidepressants are being given to our pets now? Our pets. We're, and, you know, it's not that, <laughs> I think it's so that we make it such a normal thing. It's so normal that everybody's on an antidepressant that we'll keep doing it. And the second thing I want to mention is, you know, not to mention our children. The second thing I want to mention is, you know, we live on this planet Earth, which is really a, a very large fishbowl, you know. And if you go to this side of your fishbowl and poop in it, unless there's a system to clean it, it's going to be, you know, with, with a snail or whatever, you know, whatever ecosystem, the way ecosystem deals with waste. But these drugs, when we take them into our mouth and then we excrete them into our water supply and then yes. they go and it goes into our oceans and, and then it goes even into our public water supply. I have a filter at home that filters some of this out, but I mean, I'm the very rare exception. I wish people would realize that just drinking public tap water, you are drinking what other people are being medicated with, at least on a very small level. And how does that affect our oceans too and our beautiful cetacean beings in the oceans? What do they have to say about all of this? Uh, for starters, I do not like the idea that by nature of drinking water, I am absorbing a fraction of someone else's inability to deal with their pain. 
So I, I, I call for social responsibility here. Um, let's try our best to stop poisoning ourselves with these chemicals. And yeah, it is, first of all, there are the byproducts of elimination of humans. We won't even talk about the chemicals and, and toxins that are in the water. And the fluoride deliberately put in the water, and now they're putting lithium in the water in a lot of cities. This is deliberate. I think I've lost your sound. Yeah, oh, there you no, actually, there you I actually whispered that because I wanted to keep the screen okay. on you. But uh, okay. I remember I was driving down the street in Austin, Texas. This was several years ago, listening to a city council meeting for some reason. And I heard them talk about how they wanted to put lithium in the public water supply in Austin, Texas. I, I you know, I just about slammed the brakes on my car. But they're like, doing it in some yeah, cities. It's crazy. Candice, I have to excuse myself for one second because it has started raining and I need to close the door. Just be right back. Do that. I remember when, when this lithium wow. thing came out and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that I was hearing. I wanted to put lithium in the water. There was a big debate about it. And at the time, and this was several years ago, maybe 2009, uh, I believe they voted against it at that time. Patricia, I was just finishing my story about the, the lithium. Sorry about that. It was about 2009 or maybe a little before that. And they, they voted against it. But I remember um, how, you know, uh, offended, a shocked, a, astonished I was that they were talking about the fact that they wanted to, to medicate people in such a big way. And they just, they patted down the idea about, well, lithium, you know, it's a, it's a natural substance. Exactly. I've been hearing that too. Oh my gosh. It occurs naturally. It's like, yeah, really, if it occurs naturally, why do you have to add it? Right, right. But if you look at, it's pretty clear. You've got additives into the water, lithium fluoride, which we know calcifies around the pineal gland and has been seen. I mean, has been shown this powder around the pineal gland has been seen in autopsy. So this is not some new age idea. Okay. Then you've got anesthetizing the children. I mean, the ADHD syndrome, which I don't think is a real, I mean, you create the illness and you, you create the med, then you invent the illness. So if I were a four or five year old child sitting in a classroom, me, Patricia Corey, the child that was encouraged to, to see in my time, I would be a, a, a complete mothball today. And, you know, the question is, what are they doing to these children? And then, the, of course, the parents, if you don't allow the, the, the school to mandate, they're taking the kids away. And some people are being uh, prosecuted for child abuse, for uh, demanding that they, well, not demanding, for refusing to medicate their kids. This is a serious situation going on here. And, you know, it's across the board. It's vaccines, it's meds medicating your dog seriously people if you allow this to happen then you're part of the problem do not uh, you know if here on the island i i have wonderful vets hi if you're listening <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they wanted to vaccinate my puppy for rabies and we had the conversation why if i'm not traveling why do, there are no rabies on the island why so as they were trying to convince me it's the right thing to do i said look on the label of the uh, medicine and tell me if it has thimerosal in it. And she said, what's that? And I said, mercury. She said, oh no. I said, look on the label. Sure enough. So here's my vet going, oh yes. I go, yes. There's aluminum. We know, we know this. I don't need to go through this with you. But my point is they're slipping it to the dogs. The, I mean, the animals, the children, the adults. There is a campaign on here to, to anesthetize and God knows what else with all these men. So we are now in a very difficult situation because uh, governments are mandating it or you can't go to school, you can't work in hospitals. And what's the next thing that there, it's going to be mandated? The chip? That's coming. And my answer to this is um, get, as far as way, get as far away as you can from urban situations if you can. Yeah. So if you can make those decisions now to move out of urban, highly dense urban situations, it's something to really consider. And if you can't, then you have to orchestrate 
how you're going to deal with these issues to keep your sovereignty. And as, as gloomy as that sounds, I, I, I do want to preface it by saying, we will win this. We will. Enough people are up against the wall and that's when we fight back. So again, another beautiful pearl from the Syrian High Council earlier on was, um, it's when you are challenged that you create great work. When you're complacent and everything is just fine, you don't get a lot done, you don't need to. But now that you are, your backs are against the wall, you are rising and we are seeing you rise and stand tall. And it takes courage and determination and clear thinking, which is why, again, I'm saying, please, if you are being handed these prescriptions, understand that they, they, they definitely affect your ability to make decisions. Absolutely. That's so beautifully put. You know, this, the medications going into our water supply, I know you have a, a particular connection with the cetaceans and the, oh, yeah. the dolphins. I want, have you heard them talk about this? I mean, yes, the pollution and the plastics, but I really wonder, you know, are we in, in measure medicating them as well? How do they deal with that? Um, I worry well, a lot about the oceans. Yeah, I do too. And of course, I'm, I've chosen to be surrounded by ocean here. Um, my communications with the dolphins and the great whales, and you know that there, there is that book, Before We Leave You, where they channel them. Uh, they are more concerned about sound. That's their primary issue, because their mission is to weave sound across the bodies of water that encircle this planet. They are the weavers of sound. They are the, and if we look at water as emotion, which we, we, we do identify the emotional uh, body with water, then we're talking about keeping the balance, the harmonics of Earth's emotional body in harmony. And I believe, here comes the sun again, I'm back in the bright light. <laughs> um, I believe that their, their mission is that, to keep the music of the ocean alive. And that with the Navy blasting sonar through the oceans and, and every kind of ship using sonar and bombs and all of this noise, extreme noise, that they are, a lot of them are leaving us. And when we see huge pods of whales and dolphins, 150, 200, uh, beaching at, all at once. And then you hear that a few hours earlier there was a naval sonar test. It doesn't take Einstein to figure out that they're trying to flee. They're trying to get away from the noise. And in that process, a lot of them are having their heads blown apart. We're finding whales and dolphins with their brains blown open or bleeding internally in that oral cavity. So yes, of course, the concern for what we're doing to the ocean is any sentient being would, would wonder why humans are determined to abandon their, their ecosystems. This is a point that usually gets people a little aggravated. So I'd like to clarify my thoughts here. Um, Someone once said to me, yeah, Patricia, you seem to want to preach about what, what humans are doing wrong without any solutions. And I'm not preaching. I'm a human too. I, I make the best choices I can, but I still am a consumer. I still drive a car. I, like, for example, I refuse to drink any water, bottled water out of plastic. And, you know, aside from all the activism that I do, I do my best to make conscious Choice, good for you. Conscious choices. I have a Berkey filter here. I, I filter my water. Um, but inevitably, I take responsibility. And that's what I'm calling people to do. Not to feel bad or guilty or wrong, but to stand up to the responsibility that even though we want to blame the government and the Anunnaki and the reptilians and evil aliens and whatever else for all the, the difficulties in the world, the truth is, do you drink water out of a plastic bottle? What do you do with the bottle when you're done? And the answer usually is, oh, in a, in a good day, 
I recycle it. Or, well, of course, I, I handle my garbage. But the bottom line is it ends up in the ocean. Let's get serious. The, on the other hand, there are some fabulous people doing wonderful things. There are some young guys that have invented a couple of different types of machines to scoop up all this plastic. And we are seeing some very innovative technologies coming around to help solve these problems. As for the pollutants and poisons and meds in the ocean, oh my God, I, I, just, I just don't know. We have to be better than this. And it starts, again, you can blame the government, they're not doing enough, but it starts with, with making those decisions. No, I'm not taking your chemicals. Yes, I can have a headache. I can feel the headache for half an hour. Right? I mean, it's just like people pop pills before they even know what they're feeling. It's like ibuprofen, aspirin, Vicodin, all these things. And it's all very detrimental. So, you know, my message without interfering medically with people is scrutinize more what your body is telling you and understand the, the, the repercussions, not only to your own body, but to the planet, as you say to the ocean, to the whales and dolphins, to all living beings. Yes, it's really true. Actually, here on Facebook, uh, Shakti Sirius says, here, lepto shots and boosters are mandatory for dogs, but many have died and are getting sick. My dogs had kidney and eye issues after the vaccines. And um, so it's, you know, it's, it's everywhere and it's, it's sad, but we will take a stand while we can. Um, I, I want, want to just preface that comment by saying, are you sure? Because my vet said that the rabies was mandatory. And when I pushed, he said, there, there are two, that's why I keep going from he to she. Yeah. He said, well, it's not exactly mandatory. I said, well, then what is it? I mean, mandatory is a word I don't like anyway. Yeah. The rebel that I am. But are you now saying that it's advised? And he said, well, it's mandatory if you travel with your dog. I said, that's not going to happen. And, and he backed off. And so the bottom line is challenge these people. We go to these people. They tell us they've got the white coat on. They tell us what we have to do. Here's the med. Here's the shot. This is mandatory. And before you know it, we, don't, we, we haven't even challenged it. Do your homework. I mean, when I made that vet look at that label, she was shocked. And maybe she'll think twice before she recommends it for someone else. But I said, my dog is not getting any rabies shots. That's not going to happen. And I said, and, and we're done with the boosters. We're done with all that too. They had the original puppy shots. I go, that's it. Because the whole concept here is it's supposed to create the antibodies that protect them for their life. So what's with this every year shooting up my dogs again? It's not going to happen. And, you know, there's a lot of conversation now about how vets are over medicating and over vaccinating dogs. And we won't even talk about humans. Yeah, it, it's everywhere. You know, I have to say, I love my vet. Um, we, we talk all the time about these kinds of things and metaphysical things. You know, in, I have horses and with horses, the very, you know what the standard thing to do with them is? The standard thing for them is to every six to eight weeks, give them a dewormer, which then of course they poop into the ground and that poison goes into the ground. It's just standard. Every six to eight weeks, I don't know what the percentage is, but the majority of horse owners do this all the time. And when I woke up, you know, I, I started really questioning this. And my current vet, you know what I do? I, I have a fecal exam. That's right. I have a routine fecal exam. And they look, I'm buzzing now even with that. It must be an important one. No, there's no evidence of worms. There's no reason to give this medication. And you know what? Same with, with, same with shots. If you have a problem, you know, well, I need to know if you are immunized against it. Well, guess what? You can take a titer test. You don't even need to do these booster things. There are, there are things that you can do, and there are ways you can help up your community in a gentle way um, with even people like your vet. My, my vet, my best story with her is yeah, I told her that my dogs were having so many issues that I'd done some research, and I was going to put them on raw food, and she she just the only time she ever screamed at me over the phone, you know, she was like, no, nah, you know, and, and, and then what we did was we got together and we talked about it. And what happened is really, you know, the big pet food people uh, sponsor the vet schools, the vet schools teach 
what is the correct nutrition for your dog, which is this box dry kibble that they don't want to eat. And my dogs were suffering on it. And my vet's instant reaction was, Salmonella, you can't do it. Poor nutrition, all of this. Do you know what now, Patricia? She's the biggest distributor of raw pet food uh, in our area of rural Kansas. Um, so you. you can work with your vets. Yes, that's my, that is a point. And I, I would like to speak to this because I have my little, my little dog who, by the way, is dying to get on camera. Um, <laughs> oh, I'd love to see her. That's good. Come on, baby. Oh, she's being silly. Um, she had the worst skin problems. First of all, I, I, let me backtrack here. I am an avid antagonist when it comes to kibble. And there was a wonderful uh, documentary, which I, I can't remember the name of it right now, which exposed what's in the kibble, even the best brands, all these dead and sick carcasses that they pick up in the back of, but, of, of butcheries and put into this kibble. It's too disgusting. I won't go there. But she was bad, really bad. She was raw. Her, she scratched so much, she was raw. Little Shih Tzu, little puppy. And the vet said, well, we can try this, we can try that, but she's probably going to have to go on steroids and this and that. And as she got worse and worse, I, you know, I kept saying it's the food and they kept saying, well, okay, it's indigenous to this island. When dogs come here, a lot of them get this problem. We don't know what it is. I said, it's the food. And we kind of went round and round. And finally, I acquiesced to giving her cortisone for a month. And she stopped scratching, but it's like, okay, well, so we did this topical band-aid, now what? And back to the raw again. So I said, okay, we're going with raw food. Now, try to understand, I'm a vegetarian of 29 years. So uh, this was a big issue for me to have to accept, am I willing to have meat in my home for the good of my dogs? And it was something that I struggle, I still struggle with it because I can't bear the idea of, of killing animals. On the other hand, or eating animals. On the other hand, I'm not eating it, and my dog is completely healed. So the vet is kind of incredulous. She just keeps going, what are you feeding her? I come eating, I'm, she's eating human food with me. She has a little vegetable, she has a little apples. Sometimes I put apples in her, in her meat, and she's healthy and vibrant, and the whole problem is gone. And the point here is, you know, like you said, you can work with them. It's time for us to take charge. And as a, as a spiritual community and as a psychic community, trust what you believe, what you feel. When I told the vet, it's the food, I, I knew. And don't roll up your sleeve. Don't pop that pill until you've explored other avenues, alternatives. It's very important. My vet is such a huge proponent of the food being medicine now that she even tells a story because, you know, we went down this road. She now tells a story about um, the first time it happened, but it's happened several times since. She's gotten dogs who've had terrible teeth in part because of kibble, right? Because they're not eating the right kind of things and they don't get the workout. Those, those are canine teeth. They're supposed to be dealing with things like bones. So we give um, our dogs raw meaty bones and been doing that. And she tried this um, to give a raw meaty bone to, you know, a dog whose teeth actually were falling out of their head, which seems kind of antithetical, you know, like how can that possibly work? It has helped uh, cure the dental problems of more than one dog by giving them bones to chew on like their ancestors needed to do to keep their teeth healthy and strong. And I'm with you because every morning when I dole out my food, especially to my felines, which are obligate kind of carnivores, you know, they must eat meat. That's, mm -hmm. they must eat meat. And every morning when I'm scooping, I'm, I'm kind of like you and I'm scooping that food out. I took me, it took me a while to get used to standing in my kitchen and scooping out raw juicy meat for my critters, but I know that it's the best for them. I don't need to deal with it. I'm like you, I don't need to eat this, but it's, it makes them healthy. And so what are we doing? We're just going back to what Gaia and spirit and, and the creator and source has provided for us. Those animals, that's the way they live out there, right? They don't take pills. <laughs> they don't. 
They don't. All, do you have to, all you have to do is just think about the natural process. What's natural? It is not natural to, to fill yourself up with medications. That is unnatural. So what's natural? Well, first of all, like you said, cats need to eat meat. I think dogs need to eat meat too. And um, if you get a headache or a pain or I don't know, any, any kind of problem that, that's manageable, I'm not suggesting that you've got diabetes, you shouldn't treat it. Although there are reasons why diabetes occurs and, and possibly can be healed holistically. But I'm talking about, you know, just immediately medicating, immediately. Got a headache, bam, down go the aspirin, down goes the ibuprofen. I have a friend who's a junkie of ibuprofen. And I had an accident recently on a, well, not recently. I had a boat accident here on the island years ago. And my back has never been the same. And when he was here visiting me, uh, he saw me wince and he said, is that your back? And I said, well, yeah, it's always, it's always there. And he said, oh my God, have you got any ibuprofen? And I said, darling, I can cope with a little the pain. He said, well, why should you? I said, because I don't want the poison in my body. The pain will, you know, it's there. It's telling me there's something out of alignment and I'm listening and uh, I can raise the threshold. This is also an interesting discussion. Raise your threshold a little bit. When did we become such sissies that we can't cope with a headache? We've been trained not to do that. We've exactly. been trained. We've been trained. And that's the, that's the entire thing. And I watched my elderly mother be trained and I had to break away from her programming. You know, she was of the generation where her doctor told her, why would you want to breastfeed your brand new baby? Here, science can do it better. You know, she was of that generation that began to believe that science can do everything better. Doctors know everything. And doctors are just trained by the pharmaceuticals and stuff. So we know that. Uh, but it's, it's this programming. I heard, her, I heard my son once say, he was a teenager. I had... I have a headache and my, my mother, she was elderly, but she was so dependent on these pills. The first thing that came out of her mouth was I've got extra lore tabs. I about fell over on the floor. Of course that didn't happen. And of course my son wasn't interested in it, but, the, but that that sentence even came out of my mother um, was just so sad. And uh, I agree with you. We, we just have to stop that. You know, Patricia, we've been going an hour and 15 minutes. How about we end with you? It's been fun talking to you. I could talk to you all day. How about we end with you giving us like three of your best suggestions, what we can do right now to increase our psychic awareness, maybe help activate our DNA, open up our self for an easier path, moving into the new vibrations, the new density. What are the three best things we can do for ourselves today to help us achieve that? Okay, well, the, the first is absolutely what we've been talking about, which is stop anesthetizing yourself. Take hold of your, uh, take power over your own being. Look at your medicine chest and see what you can get rid of and understand what you're putting into your body because your body is an electromagnetic bio unit of physicality, okay? So the, the purer that you can keep this unit, the, the purer the energy is going to run, the more you're going to be able to work on higher levels. This is a no brainer. If it's all gummed up with chemicals and mind altering, mood altering substances, um, you're not going to be working on those higher levels. You're fooling yourself. And you know, even ayahuasca, there's everybody's taking ayahuasca these days to have spiritual leaps and bounds. And you know, remember that ayahuasca is a poison and that when you hallucinate, it's because the body is responding to that poison. And, you know, yeah, if you're in Peru, in the jungles uh, in the, of the Amazon, and you've been involved with the ritual of prayer for 10 days and, and all of that, it may have its merit. But be, but be aware that even that is escaping that true, pure self that you're trying to uh, synthesize, number one. Number two, gee, in, in five words or less, <laughs> uh, number two, well, probably see what you can do to unplug yourself from technology, particularly, and I emphasize this, the cell phone. The cell phone is tracking you. They now have the ability to 
that there is software coming in with the cell phone that is actually being able to read your thought waves. And if you don't believe that, just see what happens in the next few years where you think of, of a product and it shows up on your, on your app. It's happening. It's already happened to me once where um, you think of something and it, it appears on your Google page. So uh, understand that there's a very deliberate attempt to merge the human mind. You know that with technology and be strong enough to say, I'm not going there. No, I don't need this phone 24 seven attached to the hip. Keep it as far away from your body as possible and keep it out of the bedroom. And as much as possible, reduce your computer. Well, not when you're listening to wonderful shows like Candace's. <laughs> uh, be cognizant, reduce the, the time that you're um, giving over to technology. And the third would be, for God's sakes, man, enjoy your life. Go out into the far, I am a nature lover. And I deliberately moved where I am to be close to nature as much as you possibly can. Get into the forest, go to the ocean, smell the flowers. I'm, I, I don't want to seem trite here, but we're, we're so far away from it. As you're sitting in your two hour commute in your car and you're two hours back with your cell phone and your eight gallons of coffee, think about, you know, I think I'd rather be walking through the forest today and do it. And there's another one, number four. <laughs> Be close to animals. Animals are, are, are so important for us. Let your children have pets. So what if there's a poop mark somewhere? So what if you chew up, you can replace an old couch, but teach your children love. Let them be caretakers of animals and receive what we, so much we get from animals. It's one of the greatest gifts. And by doing that, by loving animals and being close to them, you get all perpetual attunement and you learn about unconditional love better than any course or workshop or book can ever aspire just by looking into the eyes of, of, a, of an animal. That's wonderful. What a great way to end uh, from one animal lover to another. So I want to show everyone again, new Syrian revelations. Um, Patricia, where can people catch up with you, follow you, get newsletter, get your books, all that stuff. My website is patriciacorey.com. I'm ramping up my presence on social media, but bear with me because I'm kind of klutzy because I don't, I don't understand it all that well. But I am on Facebook and I'm on Twitter and, you know, I'm, I, uh, I'm doing a lot of interviews and I'm going to start doing a series of live Facebook. I, I did a couple of test runs. They seem to work. So I will be doing at least once a week, I'll be doing a, as you say, sweet ranting about politically incorrect ideas. <laughs> incorrect. So I, uh, I look forward to it. And the book is available everywhere. You can ask your bookstore if they don't have it. And of course, it's available on all the, the uh, online sellers. And please write me and tell me, are you also having this book vibrate in your hands? Or is it some phenomenon like that? I'd love to know. Beautiful. Well, my suggestion might be, you know, put one under your pillow. Or put one <laughs> if you got a headache, or <laughs> put one under your arm if it's hurting or something. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, your publisher was so sweet and sent me two of them. So uh, I'm looking at the other one, like, what can I do with that one? And I hope just to, to meet you in person someday so I can get your signature on here. And one of the things I that I it. hear you say on another interview, and I just want to mention it uh, somebody asked, should they start with the first of the uh, trilogy books? And Trisha says, you know, there's some pretty good recaps in here. Check this one out because we have, gosh, that makes me vibrate. I was just going to say, we have vibrated. We've changed our density. We're ready, exactly. for, we're ready for this knowledge now. Even with all of your beautiful books, there's some other ones that, that people might want to read. But thank you for your time today. This has been fun. I want to mention this. Did you notice we both, both wore the same color today? I did. And I, I find that uh, resonance uh, beautiful and amazing. I consider you a friend already. Thank you again so much. And I want to thank Greg Prescott again for in five, from in5d.com for sponsoring this show. I don't believe I mentioned that uh, first step on it. And I want to always make sure that we give kudos to where kudos need to go. I will see you around, Patricia. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you so much. It's been delightful being with you. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, Bye. everyone.
Thanks for coming.